Net proceeds go to the Les Turner ALS Foundation, and this was all made possible by a $100,000 matching grant from the John Hussman Foundation. So give a big round of applause here for John Hussman. I want to talk about the current markets, and uh, I've, I've titled this an unstable equilibrium. I'm known as probably some, somewhere between perma bear and prophet of doom, but actually I am an inordinate, inordinately optimistic person uh, who actually believes that there is virtue in finance, and the virtue in finance, ideally, is to help fund productive activity in the economy. And the reason I believe that I've been characterized as a perma bear and whatnot is that over the last 15 years or so, the wheels have gone off of that bus. And we have gotten into a situation where in finance, what is happening in terms of activity is less and less directed toward diverting scarce savings to productive activity, and much more to diverting scarce savings to speculative activity to correct the, the consequences of the excesses that developed from the prior bubble. And this is not healthy for the economy. It's certainly a situation where if you look at gross domestic investment in the United States, uh, it has been stagnant since roughly 1998, um, and you see that the investment that does occur ends up being pushed into areas that ultimately have turned out to be unproductive. So my bearishness in, you know, in, in the financial markets is, is partly related to my frustration with the, the way that finance has become more and more geared toward speculative ends and much less toward productive economic ends. And if we're going to move the economy forward with policy, it's important for us to think in terms of how do we divert funds not to more lending or not to you know, getting the stock market higher, but to how do we create an economy that fosters research, development, production, and then channels scarce resources into those activities. Um, and if you look at the long history of the United States, one of the things that you see is that what has created our prosperity has not been attempts to, quote, stimulate the economy. What's been at the grounds of our prosperity has been new invention, new introduction of new industries that employ a lot of people, right? So you go all the way back to automobiles, you go back to aviation, you go back to telecommunication, you go back to computers, you go back to uh, biotechnology, you go back to even the internet, right? Lots of people. It's hard to do that when, you know, the, the, when as about a year ago people thought the driver of the economy was, you know, started with a letter I, you know, the I economy or something, right? Because it doesn't employ enough people. Right? You, we need situations where we foster economic growth throughout the economy. We need policies to stimulate research, investment, new activities, new products, because a recession is not just a drop in demand. It's a shift in the character of what is demanded. It, a recession basically says demand is less now for products that have been in excess supply. And there are probably scarcities somewhere else. If there are scarcities elsewhere that we're addressing by creating new production, right? we're going to get economic growth because we're going to divert resources to that. That's going to pick us up. But if we don't have you know, research, new, new products, new inventions, new industries coming up, and if we're not fostering that kind of a world, and if finance is diverting money to these areas over here, rather than productive areas, we're not going to get much traction. So, uh, so when I talk about equilibrium today, I'm talking about the, the situation where, where we have conditions that have created an outcome. And the question is, what happens to that outcome? 
So a uh, few concepts of equilibrium. Uh, there's flow equilibrium. Flow equilibrium is, for instance, that in a period of time, a system is in equilibrium. A good example is the stock exchange. On any given day, the number of shares sold on a secondary market is exactly the same as the number of shares bought. So if somebody tells you that the stock market went up today because there were more buyers than sellers, right, they don't understand the concept of flow equilibrium. Stock equilibrium is a condition where the quantity outstanding of a given security that, is, that, that has been issued must be held by somebody until that security is retired. So for example, precisely the number of shares that corporations have issued in the past have to be held by somebody until those shares become wallpaper or until they become you know, retired by some sort of a buyout. Right? The number of uh, bond certificates issued has to be exactly the same as the number of bond certificates held by somebody. So can money go out of bonds and into stocks? No, because somebody has to hold the bonds. Somebody has to hold the stocks. And if I sell my bond to buy stocks, somebody else has to buy that bond. Right? So there's no such thing as money going into or out of a secondary market. There's no such thing as money going from one class of securities to another. That's a stock equilibrium. And by stock, again, I mean quantity outstanding. Now, there's certainly eagerness, right? If, um, if I'm more eager to own stocks than you are, and I buy stocks from you, I can push the price up. You'll ask more money from me. But in the end, the total quantity of dollars outstanding that have been issued, created, total quantity of bonds issued, total quantity of stocks issued, all of these have to be held by somebody until they're retired. We also have robust and fragile equilibria. Robust equilibria, you can hit it and you don't get much change in the outcome. Fragile equilibria, uh, I've, 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 I've given you a picture, right? You can move that slightly and, and the whole thing tumbles. Stable and unstable is, is, uh, is related to that. A stable equilibrium goes back to the same point, right? So if I, if I push it, I may be able to push it quite far, but a stable equilibrium will pull you back to your starting point. An unstable equilibrium will throw you further out, right? So uh, at least from your initial point. And you can have what I believe is true in the financial markets, unstable equilibria between a fragile equilibrium and a stable equilibrium. And that's, it, that, that sounds strange, but what I mean is this. You can have a situation where the financial markets look very much like the picture on the right, right? and yet there is a transition Right, from that static equilibrium where everything is sitting gently, stable, not well, unstable, but um, there, right? If you push it, it's not going to go back to that equilibrium. It's going to go back somewhere else, and it's going to go where? Where all those chairs are on the floor. At that point, you've got a static, stable equilibrium. You can do everything you want to those chairs. They're not going to move much. They're going to sit where they are, right? Valuation creates that sort of environment where you've got a second equilibrium that the market eventually goes to. And if you understand that there are stable equilibria out there that are the end game to the unstable, fragile equilibria that, that we might create at different points in time, then you start getting a sense of what's called dynamic equilibria, right? The, 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 the transition from one equilibrium to another equilibrium through the course of time, right? And that's really what, you know, the kind of things that, that I think about a lot when I think about <clears throat> current economic policy. Uh, let's go through a couple of insights. We've talked about there's no such thing as more buyers than sellers. Every share of stock issued must be held at all times. 
Every bond certificate has to be held until it's retired, right? So there's no money going in or out of a secondary market. Can't be, right? Primary markets, sure. I give my money to a company. Company issues new stock, right? So you've changed the amount of shares of stock out there. That's money kind of going into the stock market, as it were, right? But once the stock is there, there's, we're just trading. That's why it's called... That's why it's called a stock exchange. Here's one question before you read any further on the PowerPoint. When the Fed creates money, where does it go? One of the things that you'll hear very frequently is, is the money's got to go somewhere, right? It's got to go into stock. It's going to find its way into blah, blah, blah. It's going to find its way into the account. No, it isn't. Not in that way, right? Every dollar that the Fed creates as bank reserves exists as bits and bytes on a bank computer, right? Somebody has to own those bits and bytes at every moment in time until those bits and bytes are retired. Those bits and bytes are a security, right? You may have them in your bank account or you may transfer them to somebody else and they hold them in theirs. But somebody's got to hold those bits and bytes until they're retired. Now, then the question becomes, well, yes, but we've got a, this, uh, uh, this huge pool of bits and bytes out there. Can't we exchange those? Doesn't that make it more likely that, you know, that people will spend the money? In other words, if we create a bunch of reserves, won't we also create a bunch of loans? Well. When I was oh, probably, uh, let's see, uh, 90s, mid-90s, I was a professor at the University of Michigan. And I, and I feel like I have to apologize to my students that in, in my money and banking course. Uh, I used Michigan's book. Um, and, um, you know, and what we all taught at the time was, well, you know, if, if banks require 10, you know, if, if banks are required to hold 10% of their money on reserves, then if you create an extra dollar of reserves, it can support $10 more of deposits. And so <clears throat> we all sort of grew up on this sort of magical multiplier experience where, where, you know, the bank just lends out money to, you know, to Mr. Jones and Mr. Jones goes and spends it, you know, spends it here and there and you just sui generis get all this economic activity, right? The problem with that is that it assumes away all the economic issues that matter, right? Are there productive investment opportunities available that have been developed that demand the initiation of borrowing, right? Are, is there an ability of borrowers to service new debt? Is there a willingness of lenders to finance productive activities? And can we create an economic system that, that emphasizes some importance, regulatory systems or otherwise, of refraining from loans to unworthy and unproductive speculations? Because if we don't do that, then we'll quickly find that bank capital runs out, as Cyprus discovered. Right? So all of the economic issues that matter get sort of waved away when we talk about quantity theory and multipliers as if, as if economic activity just is generated by some change in what we do on, on the policy front. And in fact, um, we don't see much effect in the real world. What we see is that if we create more monetary base, we, turn, we reduce the turnover of the monetary base. And that's about it. Um, what I've shown here is uh, on the x-axis, the bottom, is the percentage change in the monetary base on a four-year annualized basis. So you, you know the change over four years and just annualize that. And on the, uh, you know, the vertical axis is the percent change in base velocity, the number of times that the monetary base turns over. And what you see is that um, you know, it, it intercepts zero 
uh, in terms of the change in velocity at about 6% annualized in the monetary base. And that 6% has, has actually a really useful interpretation, which is that that's the average historical rate at which nominal GDP has grown. So if you create nominal GDP, if the economy is generating nominal GDP growth about 6%, right, then, you're, then you can accommodate about 6% growth in base money with no change in velocity. But beyond that, it's just a, it's just a diagonal. And so you wonder why the Fed hasn't appreciated this. Because the failure of quantitative easing to provoke durable economic growth isn't a failure of effort. It's a failure of ideas and understanding. Right? You're just creating this huge pool of money that somebody has to hold. And as long as people have any concern about credit, and as long as people can't take on new debt, and as long as projects aren't available that are productive that encourage banks to lend, right? you're not going to get a lot of economic activity from this. What you're going to get is you're going to increase the quantity of money around, and you're going to reduce its turnover in the real economy. So let's take a look at two equilibria that are important here in terms of what we're seeing in the financial markets. One is to think about what's going on in terms of monetary equilibrium. And again, in monetary equilibrium, every zero interest dollar that the Fed creates, monetary base is basically bank reserves plus currency. Currency really doesn't fluctuate that much. It just sort of trends higher over time. You, you tend to get you know, pickups in currency demand, you know, like around the year 2000 incident and so forth. But normally speaking, uh, currency demand is relatively smooth. And then you've got this huge increase in bank reserves that, that, uh, that comprises the vast majority of the monetary base. Well, every dollar of that monetary base has to be held by someone at all times until it's retired. So what does that mean for us? Well, if, if you happen to be holding that hot potato, what do you want to do? You want to get out of it. And you want to hold something else that has some higher yield. And so really, the fundamental purpose and the fundamental um, mechanism of quantitative easing is to provoke discomfort among investors, to provoke a speculative reach for yield. Now we can see this uh, really clearly. This is, this is data going back to, uh, to the 20s. Uh, and it shows on the bottom the amount of monetary base per dollar of GDP. Right? So, it, so you can say, for instance, right now we are at about 19 cents, just short of 19 cents of monetary base per dollar of nominal GDP. And you know, there have been some cases, for instance, in the 70s, where we had only about 5 cents of monetary base per dollar of GDP. I'm sorry, early 80s, when, when, when Volcker was really uh, coming down hard on money growth in, in, in attempts to curb inflation. And what we see in the treasury bill yield is what economists call the liquidity preference curve. This is real live economics that shows up in data. And it shows up with extraordinary robustness. You create more monetary base per dollar of nominal GDP, and you will get lower short-term interest rates. Why? Because people feel like they have to hold something else, and they'll bid up equivalents to money. And the closest equivalent to zero interest money is a treasury bill that yields just a little bit more than zero. And so you create a lot of that, and you go out on that curve. And we are continuing on that curve. And if the Fed continues on its monetary policy right now, you will continue on that curve up to about 27 cents by the end of the year right, of monetary base per dollar GDP. The problem is, how do you normalize? There are only two ways. One is to reduce the amount of monetary base, and the other is to increase the amount of nominal GDP. Right? Nominal GDP itself can be increased in two ways. One is to have massive real growth in the economy, but we haven't created 
the environment of invention and productive, you know, productive opportunity that, that sort of supports that. Or we could have a big increase in inflation. Right? So at some point, and I'm not making a prediction exactly when, we're going to be in a situation where we have two choices. We will either have to reduce the quantity of monetary base per dollar of GDP, if we ever want to get 2% interest rates again. Maybe we don't. Maybe we'll stay at zero interest rates for the next 14 years. If we, if we halted the monetary base today and waited 14 years for nominal GDP at 5% to pick up, it would take 14 years in order to get us back to 2% interest rates. If we are forced to go sooner, or if the, if the economy ever picks up enough that, that requires us to do so in order to avoid inflationary consequences, we will have disruption. And we almost have to have some sort of disruptive exit to this because the only ways out are either to have nominal GDP grow either rapidly by inflation or over an extraordinarily long period of time where we have where we looked like Japan. And the only way you get that extraordinarily long time where we look like Japan is also if our economic growth looks like Japan. Right? Or we have to have the largest monetary tightening in history. It's not clear which one we get, and we will probably get some combination. But it's important to understand what the dynamics are here of what the Fed is doing. But what's important for the financial markets is that this monetary equilibrium causes a speculative reach for yield. And that's what we see in treasuries. That's what we see in credit-sensitive uh, debt, junk debt. That's what we see in corporate yields, where corporate debt is at the lowest level in history. So we see a lot of, uh, a, lot of a reach for yield. Now let's look at fiscal equilibrium. What else is going on in the economy that's affecting the financial markets, and particularly the stock market here? Well, if you think about fiscal equilibrium, the key insight is that it is an accounting identity, not a theory, not, a, you know, not, not something that a Nobel Prize econ winning economist has to write down with, with 36 equations. It is an accounting identity, true by definition, that the deficit of one sector must emerge as the surplus of another. So look at the combined total of government and household saving as a percentage of GDP. And what you see over the last few years is an historic plunge in those savings rates. The government is running a deficit of about 7% of GDP, and household savings rates are the lowest in history. What effect does that have? Well, record profit margins. That may seem like a stretch, but if you think about the equilibrium involved, it's not a stretch at all. Corporate profit margins right now are 70% above historical norms, precisely because the combined government and household savings are in such a negative position. Again, the deficits of one sector have to show up as a surplus of another sector. And in this case, we have corporate profits. The way to think about that, if you don't like just thinking about it as an economic equilibrium or as an accounting identity, is that all of these transfer payments and all the government deficits that we're seeing and the depressed household savings are allowing something extraordinary to go on, which is that corporate revenues are being maintained even while the wage share of the US economy is at the lowest level in history. Right? So you've got the ability to produce and sell. You know, the, some of this is due to outsourcing, right? where you can pay lower wages elsewhere. So there are all kinds of stories that you can tell about the individual transactions that may cause this to occur. Right? But at the end of the day, it must be true in equilibrium that the deficits of one sector show up as the surplus of another. Now, suppose this graph isn't compelling enough because 
you've got not only a trend um, relationship, you've also got a cyclical relationship, but suppose it's still hard, hard to see. Well, let's bring it into focus. And we can look at the changes in government and household savings. And we find that, indeed, changes in government and household savings as a fraction of GDP lead changes in corporate profits. And do so with an extraordinary robustness. Right? So what we're seeing here is that even without significant mean reversion in margins, we've already seen a big decline in relatively speaking. I mean, remember, we're still here. Right? But there's, you, you see that little bump at the bottom off the low? That's what we see as that drop in the blue line. And we would expect, on a historical basis, for that drop in the blue line to be associated with corporate profit growth of about zero. Right? If we get a significant improvement in government deficits and household uh, savings, we will see significant negative pressure on profit growth. And that's exactly what history would, would tell us. So if you look at um, corporate profits after tax, and here I'm using the, the, the uh, if you use FRED, Federal Reserve Economic Database, it's the series is CPA tax per dollar of GDP. And both of these are nominal. Right? Um, the historical norm for corporate pro profits is about 6%. Right? Um, right now, we've got margins above 10%. Right? If you look at the red, that's the subsequent profit growth over the next four years. And one of the things that you see very clearly is elevated profit margins are associated with weak four-year profit growth. Uh, the right scale is inverted. Right? So higher profit margin, lower profit growth on the right scale. Uh, and right now, we're at profit margins that would imply profit contraction over the next four years at about a 12% annual rate. That seems absurd. And yet, it is a reflection of the fact that the deficit of one sector has to be the surplus of another. And if we are going to contain the deficits of the household and government sectors, we will end up containing the surplus of the corporate sector. And we can see that throughout history. And this goes back to 1947. So this is a long time. So what does this all produce? Well, we've got this distorted, unstable equilibrium. In monetary policy, we've created an ocean of zero interest money that somebody has to hold. That's a hot potato, and it encourages a search for yield. Where do people think they've found that yield? Stock market. Why? Because when you look at the outcome of fiscal policy, we've created a deficit that emerges as a surplus specifically as elevated corporate margins. And that creates this illusion of yield, forward operating earnings yield, that looks like it's a good, sufficient statistic for future corporate profitability. But in fact, those corporate earnings and those corporate margins are about 70% above historical norms. So let's ask a question. What's the likely return over the next decade? If you look at this data. Well, one possibility is you use models like we have on the left. Um, and these, these are based on a forward earnings model. But a forward earnings model that adjusts for the normalization of profit margins over a decade long period, which Wall Street doesn't do. Wall Street doesn't think about doing. Um, one is. Uh, Estimate based on dividend, one is estimate based on a, another smoothed fundamental, right? Schiller PE, you're averaging 10 year real earnings, right? Um, and one based on market capitalization over GDP. You'll notice that the fundamentals that are being used here are smooth fundamentals in the sense that they aren't wildly affected by the position of profit margins over the economic cycle. And as a result, these methods work really well. In fact, I've included the calculations on the next slide. So if you want to take this home and you want to grab the data, you can you know, calculate all these things for yourself. 
Uh, and you'll notice in uh, 2009, uh, stocks were actually reasonably valued. They were, uh, on, on the basis of these models, likely to produce 10-year returns above 10% over the next decade. Uh, we can talk elsewhere about my stress testing struggles in 2009 because, uh, because I was quite convinced that it was a fiduciary duty to make sure that our methods worked against depressionary data as well. And I lost some time there that lost some, uh, you know, lost uh, some credibility in terms of what we're looking at. Um, in terms, you know, and uh, it's part of why I'm looked at as a perma bear. But I think the important thing is, this is in 2009. We're at levels where we would estimate the 10-year prospective return on stocks to be about three and a half percent. Now. You might instead say, well, the Fed model, these people tell me that the risk premium is good. Alan Greenspan told that to me, right? Other people have told me that there, there are very robust risk premiums out there. How are they all calculating it? Operating earnings yield minus treasury bond yield, or they assume stocks will return the dividend yield plus about 6%. 6.3% growth, which is basically the long-term growth rate of GDP and long-term long peak-to-peak growth rate of earnings if you go back over the century, you know, if you look across economic peaks. And so they'll do that and they'll subtract off the 10-year yield from that. How does that model perform in terms of explaining subsequent 10-year returns? Mm, not that well. You're talking about a 23% correlation on the right side versus about a 90% correlation on the left side. Which model do you want to use? Up to you, but I would be compelled to follow methods like this. And I, I won't go through all these, but these are the calculations. They're fairly straightforward. Basically, they assume uh, some geometric return to uh, reasonable historical norms for these smooth fundamentals a decade out. And that's how you get these very strong correlations with subsequent returns. Last thing I want to say is this equilibrium, and it is an equilibrium. It's not a disequilibrium. It's just a fragile, distorted equilibrium that has a stable equilibrium somewhere else. Right? That's really the point here. And this fragile equilibrium that we're in because of monetary policy, because of fiscal policy, and because of the combination of yield-seeking plus the appearance of yield through forward operating earnings because profit margins are elevated, this creates an environment where stock returns prospectively are very low. In fact, all, all returns prospectively are very low because that's really the point of QE. It's to create discomfort, cause a search for yield. So if you look back in 1982 and you look at T-bill yields and treasury yields and corporate yields and and the prospective yields uh, returns over the next decade on the S&P using the average of the methods that I just showed you, you saw that the prospective return on stocks over the next decade was about 20%. And in fact, that's what you got. Uh, if you look at uh, 2000, the red line, we had reasonable T-bill, treasuries, corporate yields. But the prospective return on the S&P 500 was negative. And you could have calculated that at the time. And we did. And we, you know, one of, one of the reasons I hope that some of this will have weight with you is that we've always eventually been right. And right in a way that overcomes any miss that we, we experienced in the interim. Uh, so one can make the case that at an economic bottom or at a valuation bottom, if we don't go long fairly quickly in the next time, right, then maybe something's wrong. But, I, but if you're looking at where we are today, the arguments that we're looking at today and the conditions we're looking at today are not dissimilar to what we saw in 2000, 2007. If you look at 2009, uh, you actually would have had a preference for corporates and S&P 500, and that would have been right, right? But if you look today, we're just facing a reasonably unfortunate menu of 
investment prospects for long-term money. The good news is that will change. It will change. One of the, I go back to Thich Nhat Hanh, one of the things he says is, is nothing is impermanent, long live impermanence. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's a good way to think about uh, the present situation. We are in a, an environment where things are rather distorted. We know the causes of that equilibrium, but we also know that there will be better opportunities over the course of a market cycle. And so the, so the idea here is not to move you out of stocks or move you to, incredibly to a risk averse standpoint. Rather, my hope is that you'll evaluate your own risk tolerance and, and what you want to track the market, what you don't care about tracking the market. Your tolerance for risk under an accurate assessment of risk and then set your portfolios appropriately, right? Very few investors are willing to take as, as much tracking risk as we are, right? But because we, we only care about the full cycle, right? But whatever your own approach is, I think it is important to understand what the true menu looks like rather than the menu that you might be inclined to believe because of profit margins. And I hope this gives you a reasonable framework in which to think about those things. So in your argument, you seem to place a fair amount of weight on the idea that the, the um, government and personal dis-savings mm -hmm. leads by essentially an identity of equilibrium to high profit margins. But I don't understand that. So I do understand that corporate and private dis-saving leads to corporate savings. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that corporates have been hoarding, quote unquote, hoarding their cash. They, the, the amount of corporate investment right. is quite low relative to profit. Okay. But that's very different from saying there's a, a causal relationship between government and personal dis-saving and profit margin. All right, so, so, so two, two aspects of that. One is that, that, we, uh, that we get largely the same results from abandon, abandoning that argument and just looking at the valuation data, right? So we get, we get largely the same implications. Yeah, okay, so, so, there, so that we get largely the same uh, very highly correlated implications for tenure returns uh, from a wide variety of methods that have historically done much better than FO, you know, sort of naive forward operating earnings methods. But, but to your point, uh, you're, you, you are correct in the sense that if we had more robust gross domestic investment, right, then we would have, then we would have uh, a, a different, you know, uh, a different level of corporate savings. We would have higher GDP. We would have, we would end up having less, uh, less deficit on the fiscal side because one of the things that I've shown in another, uh, in another piece is that growth in gross domestic investment precedes growth in uh, improvements in the fiscal situation, precedes growth in uh, personal incomes. So, so if we had, and if we were able to create a robust environment for gross domestic investment, if we, if we had R&D credits and investment tax credits and all kinds of things that in some sense reduced the, uh, the, the, the amount of savings that corporations were, were actually engaged in, we would actually have smaller deficits. And you can, actually, you can show that in the data too. Um, so, so in some sense, you know, what, what people want to hear is they want to hear the entire stream of transactions that leads to this accounting identity. And the fact is, that that requires an analysis of billions of individual transactions. Uh, there's, there, there, are, there are decisions that are made by individuals at every point in the economic flow, but in the end, it's, it's very hard to look at the data and say, we aren't spending more than we are earning 
and that spending is going to somebody and that somebody is paying less in wages than they ever have and so there's there there, there is a there's a whole set of transactions there so so i guess the answer is i can't pick apart the the transactional detail of this but it's you know it if you, were to, if you were to do any sort of statistical analysis of this, again, it's not only just levels. We're not looking at the correlation between two 45 degree lines where people will always find a 90 some percent correlation. What we're seeing is correlations that are not only phased, right? That are not only correlations with changes in one versus changes in another, but they're correlations where Household and government savings lead changes sure. in so, look, I'm sorry. You, corporate profit margins. You're shifting your argument entirely. So I agree with you that the high profit margins is a very important fact that right. needs to be analyzed and understood. It's right. a sort of extremely important background factor to the stock market valuations, corporate profitability, and so forth. Totally agree. You made an argument that said there was virtual, well, I think you said there was actually an accounting identity about um, government and personal dis-saving leading to higher corporate profit margins. And what I'm saying is, I don't understand that at all. There's, uh, hang on, okay. and your response basically, I mean, I'm sorry, but it seems to me like you basically said, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, forget about it. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not saying forget about it. There is no direct accounting identity connection between government and personal dis-saving Actually, there is, you, you, you also actually have to add two extra pieces and, and the, to make it a precise identity. And that those two extra pieces are fixed investment, gross domestic investment, and the other piece is, uh, is, is current account deficit, right? And if you, it's, it, it's corporate, uh, well, right, but, but if I, if I earn profits, right, yeah. and I take my profits and I subtract out my domestic gross, my in investment, what I am left with is corporate savings. Yeah. So, okay, we, we, should probably, we, we should probably continue this, this yeah. later just in case there are other questions. But, yeah, we, but I, we, do, well, I don't want to... I, I don't want to minimize the question, so I, I, I am happy to talk to you at length. Uh, but by the way, I, I wasn't saying that we, that we should discard the argument. What I'm saying is that, that, even, that even if you just look at the data, right, even without making that argument, you come to the same conclusion. But we'll, we'll, we can talk more about it afterward. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. Uh, John, a quick question for you, I think. Uh, to what extent, we're modeling this data, and, and we're kind of doing the same thing in terms of the last century, looking at uh, what things have happened here. But this, is this last century, is, could it have been unique enough? I mean, we've had a lot of things happen in energy and demographics, in uh, the ending of the gold standard, of all these kinds of things. And so, you know, we're looking at these things and saying, okay, well, this has happened here this century. Is a century long enough to say, okay, we should be expecting, you know, 6% GDP on average? Is, uh, yeah. uh, just address um, that point. Yeah, so, so I think, uh, I, I think, one of the things that we need to do at base whenever we talk about um, you know, stock market returns is to, is to break down those stock market returns into an identity. And the identity for stock market returns is that you know, the, the, the long-term return you get is the combination of capital gain and income. Right? Income is fairly easy to measure. You measure it off of yield. So, it's, so it really is that, that capital gain part right, that, that, that you worry about. Um, there is some amount of variability that we, we may very well see on the nominal side of things. You know, on, the, on the real side of things, we pretty well have an idea of population growth and demographic factors that, that will influence real growth over time. We have a reasonably good uh, experience, not only from the U.S., but also looking at global productivity, right? That, that we are seeing 
somewhat, you know, somewhat of a reduction in uh, productivity, and, and we can actually map productivity growth rates by point in, in industrial development, right? So right now, you know, underdeveloped countries end up having higher real growth rates, they end up hi having higher real interest rates. And those two things are correlated because, you know, because they're growing off of a small base and they, they actually can, you know, can support off of that low base a large amount of productivity growth. In the United States, given the size of the country, we've got a pretty good idea of the productivity side of things as well. So we've got within a fraction of a percent or a percent or so, uh, demographic factors and productivity factors that give us an idea of the real side of things. So I think the main issue is what happens with inflation, right? Because that's what affects the nominal side of that, of that calculation about um, you know, capital gains and what we would expect from stocks. Uh, what's interesting about inflation is that people, people actually are able to hold two pro propositions in their head at the same time. One is that if we look at the data, historically stocks have provided a reasonably good long-term hedge against inflation. So if you look at inflationary periods when inflation has existed, stocks have provided a commensurate return. But yet we also hold in our head the idea that inflation is bad for stocks. So which is it? Well, if we think in terms of the dynamic equilibrium, everything starts making sense. Because what actually happens is during the transition from low inflation to high inflation, stocks do preposterously badly on average. And they do badly because they're required to now price in a higher nominal return. Right? And if you, get a, if you get a big decline in valuations, right? Once that decline in valuations occurs, like we saw in, you know, 74 and like we saw in 82, from that point on, stocks do perfectly well relative to inflation because they've priced it in. It's the lack of pricing in inflation that becomes the problem. And so, and so I would argue, with, you know, in response to your question, that the main concern or the main um, uh, wild card in all of this is what happens on the inflationary side. People are surprised that we haven't seen inflation yet, right? given all the money we're creating, because they're operating off of a, mo you know, off of a quantity theory model. But the, the issue with base money is somebody has to hold it. As long as people are willing to hold it, or at least marginally willing to hold it, because they're worried about this or that, or they don't have any opportunities to invest it in, in real economic you know, goods and services, you know, then they're okay. I would argue that the inflationary effects are likely to happen after the next recession when we actually have robust, more robust growth and people actually do want to consume. And then, then the marginal trade-off between goods and services and money changes. So back half of this decade. Round of applause for uh, here. Thank you very much. <laughs>